Should we be worried about the WEF and our own government push to disseminate our farming, even though we're one of the leaders in climate neutral production? Should you be worried about the WEF? Um, I suppose to some degree it depends on what else you have to be worried about. You know, because one of the things you might ask yourself is, are you worrying about the WEF because there's other things you should be worrying about that you don't want to think about? And a lot of that often happens to people, you know, they get their heads in the cloud about some abstract political issue because there's all sorts of tyranny and hell in their house that they don't want to face. And so they bury themselves in the news instead of cleaning their room, let's say. And so you got to watch that. You got to watch that tendency on your part to replace the personal with the political. But uh, it's also the case that attention to the political has its place. I'm not a fan of the WEF. I'm not a fan of globalist utopians. I think they're... Huh. Pretentious and ignorant beyond comprehension. I don't like central planners. I don't think central planning works. And I particularly don't like central planners who deny local sovereignty. And that might be the sovereignty of the individual or the sovereignty of the province or the state or the country. Better to have decentralized power, better to have responsibility distributed down the hierarchy all the way to the individual. And I don't, I don't trust people who don't know that. Um, I, I was noticing the other day, this really, to be vulgar, pissed me off. I was on an airplane flying here and I looked up some additional flights because my flight got delayed and I looked up the flights on Google from Dallas to Auckland and when the flights came up all the flights were listed with their carbon load mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I thought you pricks <laughs> how dare you sell me something airline ticket and moralize at me at the same time. It's like, you're airlines, right? Yeah. You run planes? Yeah. Do they produce carbon? Yeah. Are you selling the tickets? Yes. But we want to make you feel guilty about the carbon. Well, no, thank you. Thank you very much. And all I see in that is, well, what's the next thing? Well, the next thing, obviously, is there's already a bank. I think Australia, a bank in Australia announced this two weeks ago. This is what they're offering you. Uh, you want to save the planet? We'll send you a report every month that details out the carbon load of all your purchases. It's like, oh, good. You're going to track what I buy, and you're going to associate each of those purchases with planetary scale damage. And you don't think that's going to go wrong. Because what's the next step? It's like, well, that's easy. So we hierarchically rank your purchases by degree of hypothetical planetary damage. And we tax you on that basis. Or maybe we just decide, why the hell do you need to fly anyways? Why are you so important? Why does your concern, your petty business concern, trump the health of the planet? Why should you be allowed to fly at all? I mean, it's a bloody miracle, right? It's a miracle. And if you don't know this, you're not thinking. You free people in a country like New Zealand, you can just hop on a jet. I mean, I know you have to be able to afford the ticket. But if you can afford the ticket, you can just hop on a jet. And you can go anywhere. And you can buy a car. You can buy a car. Think of that. And then you can just drive somewhere you want to drive. And no one can tell you not to yet. And that's a miracle. 
It's like, what makes you so important? What your stupid business? Who cares about your pizza restaurant? You're dumping carbon into the atmosphere. You don't need to fly. You don't need a car. You might not even need a bicycle. You can just walk, and you should hold your breath <laughs> while you're walking. <laughs> so I see the globalist utopian types, the WEF types, they're all concerned about climate change, and they're not. I talked to Bjorn Lomberg the other day about this, and Lomberg, I think, knows more about this than anyone else in the world. He figures all the trillions of dollars that have been spent since 2005 on climate remediation, COP27, well, we tried this 26 times already and it didn't work at all, so the next thing to do is to try it 27 times. It's like, he figures that all of the climate remediation we've managed so far, according to the UN, UN's own climate model projections has reduced the temperature of the planet one ten thousandth of a degree. And so the obvious thing to do with that sort of data at hand is to do a bunch more of it more expensively. And that's what your utopian globalists are insisting that you do. And you know you think, well, they won't come for your car. It's like, oh, ho, ho, ho. Not only will they come for your car, they already have. The European Union announced, and so did California, but we'll talk about the European Union, I think it was two weeks ago, what no internal combustion cars allowed to be sold in the European Union by, I think it was 2035. It's like, this is utterly insane. But, like I said, you peasants, what makes you think you have a right to a car? And I, I've thought this for years, that there's almost nothing more miraculous that our society has ever produced on the, on the front that unites metaphysics and technology than the automobile. You think how free a country has to be so that some 16-year-old Yahoo can buy a 500-horsepower Mustang and race it down the streets. Like, do you know how dangerous that is? It's like the most dangerous thing you ever do in your life. And maybe you'll, let, you'll encourage your teenager to do it, because you'd rather be free than, you'd rather be free and living in adventure than be a secure slave. It's like, here's the keys, kid. Try not to die. I thought, I think one of the things the West did that undermined the totalitarian state so brutally was to entice them with automobiles. Because there's nothing that screams individual freedom louder, louder than a car, right? Noisy, dangerous, fast, private, free. You export those to a totalitarian country, and the technology itself says, you can do whatever the hell you want, even if it's dangerous. Well, that's the ethos of a courageous people. It's like, well, we can't have that anymore because why? Carbon. <laughs> yeah, well, carbon. It's like, yeah, you hate automobiles, you hate comedians, you're a tyrant. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't like the WEF. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say one more thing about that, I guess. So I wrote this article for The Telegraph a couple of weeks ago about uh, an article that Deloitte, one of the world's biggest consulting companies, had put out. And they'd modeled the climate, which they didn't. And then they modeled the economy on top of that, which you can't. And then they projected that out 100 years, and you can't do that. And, and I don't care how much you think that's mathematics and how much you think it's a model, it's just just because there's some numbers in it doesn't make it real. And, and then their conclusion was, you know, we're all going to have to tighten our belts a fair bit, because otherwise, apocalypse. 
And I read that and I think, oh, we're, we're all going to have to tighten our belts, are we? All of us, including Deloitte consultants, because they're the first ones whose belts are going to be tightened. It's like, I know how this works. Anybody with any sense knows how this works. So let's say, well, we tighten our belts and we make energy more expensive, carbon tax, but not just a carbon tax. Well, we can't have natural gas and we can't have coal and we can't have nuclear. We can have wind and solar, so then we can have way more expensive electricity or none at all. I don't know what it's gone up in Germany, like a factor of five, something like that. And it's unreliable, plus they're dependent on the Russians, which turned out to be a very bad idea, in case anyone hasn't noticed yet. Um, and so, so fine, we make energy more expensive. Why? Well, m our Deputy Prime Minister in Canada, Christia Freeland, about a month and a half ago, ca oil prices shot way up in Canada, as they have everywhere, because, you know, we hardly have any oil in Canada. We have an oil sands deposit in Alberta that's bigger than Switzerland. It's like, there's no excuse for a shortage of oil in Canada, or anywhere for that matter. Christia Freeland said, well, you know, it's a good thing that gasoline is much more expensive in Canada because then when the ordinary person fills up their automobile, they'll be reminded of just how important climate change really is. It's like, well, thank you very much, Christia. It's like, not only are you so goddamn incompetent that your bloody government doubled the price of petrol in Canada, but now you're going to insist that that's actually a moral virtue. And so, and then you might be resistant to this line of argument and think, well, you know, climate change is important. It's like, okay, I don't think so, but okay, we'll, we'll allow you that. So what are you going to do about it? We're going to make energy more expensive. Okay, fair enough. More expensive for who? Well, rich people? Well, kind of. Most rich people, they don't care if their heating bill doubles. If they cared if their heating bill doubled, they wouldn't be rich. Who cares if their heating bill doubles? People who are barely clinging to the edge of the world. Right? And we live in an economic hierarchy, that's the patriarchy, by the way, and so the lefties know this, in principle. Here's the patriarchy, nasty, capitalist, billionaire, scum rat thieves at the top, and then who's stolen everything from everyone, and then at the bottom, all those poor oppressed people who are barely clinging on to the edge of reality. And so, well, let's double the price of energy. Okay, what happens? Well, a bunch of those people who are barely clinging on to the edge of the cliff just fall off. And a whole bunch of them. Because they're way more numerous at the bottom. And all you have to do is stress someone barely clinging to the edge of the world a little bit more and they just let go and fall. And, and then you might say, and so is, is that going to help the planet as you make all these poor people who are barely making it? worse off because you double their energy costs and, and their food costs and push them into absolute poverty? And that's going to save the planet, is it? It's going to save the hypothetical poor a hundred years from now. But they're actually going to suffer and die, especially in poor countries. That's your theory. And then you might say, well, yeah, that's my theory. Better a hundred million people now than a billion people in a hundred years. It's like, no first, but I'll accept your idiot argument for a second. It's like, you're so sure that this billion people that you're hypothetically saving, in a, you're so sure about your model of the world that you're willing to sacrifice a hundred million people right now to save that hypothetical billion in a hundred years. That's how certain you are of your theories, because these people are actually going to die. Well, the answer to that seems to be yes, we're so certain of it. I'm not so certain about that. And I've seen on the left in particular, despite repeated assurances from the leftists that they care about the poor and oppressed more than anyone else, if push comes to shove, they're perfectly willing to sacrifice the poor to their 
futuristic utopian delusion of a post-capitalist society. And so, I'm not very happy with people who are willing to sacrifice other people to their utopian delusion. We saw a fair bit of that in the last hundred years already. And I think the WEF types fit very nicely into that category. And so, I'm not very fond of them, let's say. And I don't think... I don't think they have your best interests in mind, you and your carbon load.